Hello everyone and welcome to The Loft. My name is Wesley Garcia, Director of Loft Connections, and my pronouns are he, him. And my name is Julia Black, and I am the Director of Worship, and my pronouns are she, her. The Loft is a conversation-based community, and that means that we believe that conversation and open dialogue with one another is the best way to connect more deeply with our faith and the divine. We're also an inclusive and affirming community that welcomes all people from all walks of life. But we do it a special invitation to the LGBTQ plus community. You are welcome here. You are supported here. You are included here. We gather together every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. But we are not just Sunday friends. We also get together multiple times throughout the week. So if you have any interest in joining us or if you have any questions, please reach out. We can be found at theloftla.org. Thanks for tuning in. Come be a part of the conversation. I go when I need to get away. There's a peace I know that soothes the soul, and there's a life I found. I know it's not my own, so when I run to you, it's like I'm running home. Where I find peace. hands that are reaching out for you and if you're holding back tears and just try to be strong there's a place that is calling out for you this is the place that I'm always running to where I find Good morning, Loft community. Uh, it's great to uh, be with you yet again. Um, taking up on the sermon series we've been doing the last few weeks on cultivating community. Um, I titled the talk today, Gathering Together While Being Socially Distant. And it really is kind of a, a play on words, right? Because at its core, when we're talking about being together, how can we actually really do that in a way that is distant? in any way, shape, or form. 
right? There's something that comes up and something that just doesn't feel quite right when we talk about being together in a way that actually maintains a particular kind of distance. There's some intimacy loss in. And I think that's kind of where we find ourselves today. So really to me, the title of today's talk speaks to the complexity of what it means to be in community for the past year. Since the pandemic, we have been asked as a community and some communities have more or less ob like obliged and, and actually done what they're supposed to do to be in community in ways that kept us apart from each other. We've been asked to be in community in ways that are different from what we are normally used to, to be in community, but be different, to be distant. Now, perhaps when this first happened, this was kind of novel, right? Uh, teaching our parents and, and grandparents, um, or, you know, or, or our children how to use Zoom. And, 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 and there was some patience that was involved. And, and, and for me, that patience required a beverage <laughs> to help me wind down in the midst of all that stress of trying to figure out how to navigate this space. Um, or, or, or perhaps you were the person being taught, right? You were the one being taught how to do it. And, and for you, again, it was the same thing. You're like, eh, I just need to have some trust that that my, my kids and my grandchildren or wherever they know how um, to do this, that we can actually do this, that we can find a way to be together even though we are apart. Now, what at first felt novel, I think a year and a few months ago, I think now feels pretty normal, right? And this kind of normalization of being together apart has taken a toll on all of us. Introverts, like my, my, my best friend is an introvert. Even, even introverts are, are ready to get back out into the world and at least see some people, at least, at least a little bit, at least a little bit. But now I think we find ourselves on shifting ground, right? The, the rapid development of multiple vaccines and the willingness of marginalized communities, especially to work through centuries of medical racism, exploitation and minimization, these things have converged and, and people are really actually getting vaccinated. People are trying to do what they can do so that we can actually get back to some kind of new version of normal. And we are beginning to see the signs of social freedom again, right? Now, again, all of you know I'm in San Diego uh, and, and San Diego a public schools opened back up maybe a week or two ago, I think, yeah, last week. Um, now, I don't have a child in school, Isaiah's only two, so I didn't really consider what this meant beyond the fact that kids would be in school. So one day last week, I, I took Isaiah to the park um, that's near elementary school. It was about 3.45 or so, and, and the school had gotten out probably about an hour earlier. When I arrived, there were tons of kids there, just tons of kids. I mean, these would seem like a ton to me. I'm not I used to be around schools. I haven't been in elementary school since I was in elementary school. So it's probably like, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 kids or something, masked kids like running around. And and even though they were masked, and, and Isaiah wears his mask most of the time, right? Like their mask, Isaiah wears a mask. I'm thinking, okay, this should be fine. We should be okay. Um, but what I underestimated was how I would react being around that many people. I found myself having all kinds of anxiety, right? About actually being around just that many, even though it was mostly kids, just being around. It, it, just, it, seemed, it seemed like I wasn't supposed to be there, right? It felt unsafe. And I found myself at moments getting hijacked by my anxiety. My heart was beating fast. Right, I was starting to sweat more. I was just getting really, really nervous. And and those of you who, who, who maybe talked to me before, you know that I really try to embody particular kinds of contemplative practices and all of them really settle into breathing. And so as I noticed myself getting kind of hijacked by my anxiety, I really try to settle into a breathing routine to ground myself, right? To really just take deep breaths, to calm down, to name that I'm in this space outdoors that I'm with my son, that we both have masks on, that I'm vaccinated, that he's, you know, three feet tall, like nobody's up in his face, right? And that we're okay, that everything's gonna be okay. And that took me a few minutes, and I had to do it a couple of times, 
But ultimately, I found myself after about, you know, 30, 40 minutes being okay being in that space. And afterwards, as I was driving home with Isaiah, I, I thought, oh my God, is this what it's going to feel like when we start being social again? Is this what it's going to feel like? Are all of us going to have some kind of reaction like this when we start being social again, rather than being socially distant from another? What's the next phase of our community, of our time together, going to look like? So when I was selecting scriptures for this series, I struggled a bit in choosing the passage that connected to the topic of fear, trauma, and the grief that we're all experiencing in light of the pandemic. I kept coming back to the Exodus story, but to be honest, I was really reluctant to use it because I didn't want to minimize or draw too many parallels between the slavery of the Israelites and their eventual freedom and the social distancing that we are living through and our eventual social freedom because all the politicization of the COVID and the way people have politicized public health and uh, people have been like, oh, you know, not liberty and freedom and, you know, you know, all this other kind of stuff, the way people really are particularly a certain kind of um, conservative, uh, political kind of conservatism that equates any kind of infringement upon um, their life as restrictive of their freedom. But the more researched and the more I read about the historical context and purpose of the passage, really the more convinced I became that we really can glean a good word for us today, really, we can glean a good word from this text while recognizing that there are some limitations to the parallel that I'm going to be drawing, to, to, to really the, the analogies I'm going to be drawing um, today. So in this passage, the Israelites are angry with Moses and Aaron because even though they are free from bondage, they are realizing that they don't have total control like over their lives as they imagined. And indeed, they're, they have entered into a new covenantal relationship with, with God, with Yahweh, as they would say. And they, they have exchanged service to Pharaoh with, quite honestly, as is understood in Exodus, service to God. Now, service to Pharaoh, while strict and oppressive, was at least predictable, right? You were born a slave, you would die a slave. And whatever measure of freedom you could find had to come between the realities of slavery and death. Now, service to God, this kind of covenantal relationship with Yahweh, it gave you much more freedom. But it also came with, a, with moral, social, and political obligations that, in truth, the Israelites really hadn't lived with for generations. They had obligations to each other. But this particular kind of freedom is something that generationally, this kind of political freedom, this bodily freedom that they had not lived with for generations. Now, at this early stage in their wilderness wandering, it makes sense that they were struggling with this newfound freedom, right? And in, in truth, they were still haunted by the trauma of their enslavement. They were still haunted by the trauma of what they, their people, what they and their ancestors had been through. And in this sense, they could depend upon the kind of freedom that they knew they, they had experienced from God, right? They, they, they knew that despite this trauma that they were carrying, that, that they had experienced freedom and this freedom had come in light of Yahweh, right? But this was a God that, that they couldn't physically see as they were used to being exposed to in these kinds of gods in Egypt. But it was a God that they had experienced in a profound way that continued to shape them and continued to influence them in how they understood and how they saw themselves. It seems as though in reflecting on the Exodus from Egypt that the writers of Exodus suggested that God predicted that the Israelites would struggle with their freedom. And they would also struggle to remember who freed them, freed them despite their experiences, despite everything they had lived through, there was this way in which this kind of narrative was known or already predicted to be important. And so what we see here is these particularly kinds of uh, four commands, right, that were given to them um, before the Exodus takes place. Um, these four commands are, are to celebrate, to observe, to remember, and to retell. Now, key here are the commands to remember and retell. 
In oral culture, repeating and remembering are the ways that knowledge stays alive and, and how knowledge shapes our communities. Now, if the Exodus is to be central to their identity, then the commands to remember and retell are crucial in forming an identity of survival for this nomadic Jewish community, right? So Israel remembers and retells their story as a means of affirming, preserving, and at times even redefining their identity. This was the purpose of that particular command by God before they left Egypt, before the parting of the Red Sea. They were to celebrate, to observe, to remember, and retell. Importantly, we must remember that no retelling of the story is the same. Every time someone retells the story, there's, there's, there's a slight twist or variation to it. Each recounting of the event is shaped in part by the teller, by the context that they are telling the story in, and the purpose that that story is being told. Now, in a chapter written in the Africana Bible, Bible by Hebrew Bible scholar Judy Fentress Williams, calls this process remixing. She calls it remixing. And she suggests that uh, at, at its core, remixing really is about looking at the experiences of the past and finding ways to, to tell them that speak to us in our contemporary context, right? It's really about trying to understand who we are and how, or how they, how them to, it was really about for them to understand who they were in light of this experience. This way, subsequent generations could find a way into their story. So as the stories continue to be retold, right, to be remembered and retold, how, the remix, she argues, is a way for young folks to find their way into the text. For those of you who don't know, a remix is just another version of the same song, right? It's a way for an artist to perhaps do something more creative with their music. Sometimes this can work out really well, right? You can think of, well, I should say sometimes it works out well, sometimes it works out less well. So in thinking about how it works out well, we can think about Lil Nas X in his song Old Town Road. The original version, pretty good, not too bad. Adds Billy Ray Cyrus, you know, white dude, country musician, makes it a little catchy. Bam, right? Super successful single. Other times, remixes, mm, not working out so well. Taylor Swift, September. Some of you may be Swifties. This is to no offense. But it is to say that somebody should have told her that was a bad idea, right? So at its core, just because something is remixed doesn't mean necessarily going to be better. But it is going to say that it's more specific to you. It's more specific to that community, right? And, and, and so what you see here is throughout the Exodus narrative is that in moments of stress and strife, Moses exhorts the community to remember and to retell. And the longer they are out in the wilderness, the more often they have to remix and to remember and retell the story in ways that are specific to that moment and that time where they find themselves to remember the relationship that they have with Yahweh, that they are to retell the story of their escape in ways that empower them so that they might settle in and live into their place within the story of their community. And this is where I see this passage and the story of the wilderness wanderings fitting so well with us today. For the past year and a few months, our ability to be in relationship with each other has been suppressed. We lost certain freedoms that I know that I took for granted. And, and we find ourselves in this kind of liminal space where we are beginning to have some social freedoms again. Little by little, things are returning back to normal. But the trauma, right, of the past still haunts us. Like Israel, that trauma is real. It's not going away and, it, and it's not, and it is going to influence our thoughts and actions. The consequences and effects of not touching people that we love, that's going to do something to us. 
right? That we aren't fully sure what it is doing to us and what it will continue to do to us or what impact it will have on us. Working from home so much that we that the line between work and home gets blurred, that's impacting us and it's going to continue to impact us in some way, shape or form. Our children not being able to play with other kids is clearly impacting them. Or the fact that hundreds of thousands of people have died in the United States due to COVID and millions have died globally. That is impacting us. Not to mention all the social and political upheaval that we've experienced in this past year. We have been changed in light of this pandemic. But the question then becomes, how and in what ways will we allow the trauma of this past year to shape and reshape us? How and in what ways will we allow the trauma of this past year to shape and reshape us? You see, the pandemic has impacted us and and trying to suppress or resist the fact that sometimes we may just be hanging on by a thread trying to pretend that we actually aren't in that kind of space where we need help isn't helping. It's actually making things worse because not being honest with ourselves prevents us from taking that kind of inward turn and, and discerning what parts of ourselves need tending, what parts of ourselves need care and compassion in this moment. The story of the Israelites in the desert shows us that one way we might deal with the trauma of the past is to be honest and, and, and vulnerable, quite honestly, right? Be honest and, and vulnerable about what has happened to us, to share our stories with ourselves, with others whom we trust, with others who we know will receive it with care, with the care our stories deserve. Now, moving from an individual perspective to the communal, how are we going to remember and retell the story of this past year in ways that give us the courage to come together as a community? How might we remix the story in ways that center on our growth, empowerment, love, and survival, right? How might we remix the story in that way? This year was so hard. It's been so hard, but but I'm grateful when I think about it in a way and I, where I try to remix it, right? When, when I think about the past year in a way that allows me to remix it, I am grateful for the fact that I was able to spend so much time with Isaiah. This year has been exhausting for me with respect to work in so many ways. But when I think about it in a way that perhaps allows me to, to remix it, to think about what I gained from it, I was able to introduce a new book into a course that was that a friend of mine, uh, my my colleague, Dr. Peter Mena, played a part in reviewing and knows a lot about queer theology and was able to really spend time in my class doing a deep dive on it. And he gave an amazing guest lecture that really transformed a course that I had taught in the past in a way that wouldn't have been possible because normally we usually teach it at the same time and we're not able to do this kind of work. Right? There are things that have happened that when we remix the story, we find new ways to rest in and, and, and really relax into the fact that while this year was exhausting, we did learn. That while this year was stressful, we did find some way, to shape, or form to have community. There is no denying that we will be dealing with the trauma of this past year as we begin to gather together in community. It's gonna linger. Like, in all honesty, it's gonna be weird to hug some of you when I see you again. But there is more to the story of the pandemic than our struggles. Our struggles are important and we shouldn't dismiss them. We shouldn't discount them. Our struggles matter, but they aren't the totality of who we are. And it's important for us to remember that so when we retell the story of the pandemic, we can learn from rather being defined by our past. So the question is, how are we going to remix our own stories such that they help us remember all that we have been through, but also inspire us to become who God has called us to be? 
our best selves on this road, as the Methodist tradition calls it, this road towards perfection. Josh Lopez Ray is here. He, him, his. Thanks again for being with us today. If you would like to stay connected with the events happening in the community or perhaps one of our groups that is currently meeting online throughout the week, please visit theloftla.org. And please support this work. If you uh, found it helpful, please share it with others who might find it to be a blessing. Another way that you can support if you're able to is by giving online. And you can also do so by checking out the giving tab on the website. So as we leave this space today, may you dare to be brave. May you know that you belong. And may you remember that you are loved. Peace.